I'm Doug Fern, and this is my take on music recording. Over the years, I've met many fascinating and talented people in the pro audio world. Some have become good friends. I've learned a great deal from conversations with these amazing people, and I want to share some of the conversations with you. Wes Dooley is best known for his Audio Engineering Associates line of ribbon microphones. Some are perfect recreations of classic RCA mics, and others are original creations. I am intrigued how people like Wes ended up becoming experts in their field and how their early experiences shaped their career. This is the first part of a conversation with Wes, focusing on those early experiences, but also an introduction to ribbon microphones. Oh, my. When I was about three years old, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was the end of World War II. I'd been shuffled around the three years of the war while my dad was in the Air Corps and my mother was trying to spend some time with him, sometimes at Air Force bases, living in... uh, you know, wherever you could, and sometimes at my grandmother's in Tulsa. At WEEI in Boston, my uncle Wesley, J. Wesley, had uh, worked from about 35 to 40, and my mom went to high school there. She just went there because that was more interesting than Tulsa. And uh, she sang and she played piano and, you know, all, all those sort of things. So... That was the start of that odyssey, but always the stories were that uh, sometime you'll meet, sometime you'll uh, hear uh, Jay. You know, he, he does uh, everything from general interest stories to uh, he goes and covers the spring training for all the baseball. He uh, does all of the WEEI's uh, sports announcing from ringside at the fights, all that stuff. My uh, mom, Millie, thought that was absolutely fabulous, and it was. Then in in 40, he moved to try to break into the New York market, which, as we all know, is a real hard one. He wound up on the road and doing the uh, stuff with people like Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. So he got invited out in 46 to do the summer slot for, I think it was Bing Crosby, but I'd have to go back and look at the notes. So there's always these stories, and I had these recordings that he had made 80 RPM on his field set. So I'd always had that stuff. And Mom wanted me to be a musician. I had to do two years of piano with practice, and that was not fun as far as I was concerned. I said I wanted to do drums, and she said, absolutely not. So I wound up uh, in high school. My project for my physics class was to build, talked a local TV guy out of a tube, and I made a uh, amplifier so I could talk into a microphone and hear it on headphones a distance away. And I thought that was kind of fun. And then there was a radio station at Pomona College, KSBC-FM, a 250-watt transmitter with a four-bay Andrews, which I later, as a volunteer, um, spent months and months getting Collins finally bored enough to make us a deal on a one-kilowatt transmitter. Yeah, I got RCA and a whole... Yeah, I found out all the people who could do them, and I decided Collins was the best. I didn't want to spend that much money. We didn't have that much money. So every time I'd get a call from RCA saying, hey, they, this 100 megahertz transmitter, they canceled the sale. We could retune it, and it could be yours. Here's the price. I'd call the Collins guy and say, hey, here's the latest offer. Let me know when you're going to sell us one. And eventually I got that call that said, we got a transmitter. Let us know. So I called him back with a PO, and we got it. I uh, had been signed up by the Dean of Men for the ROTC. My dad was Air Corps. So I would have in 90, uh, that was back in 61 and 65, I would have been a uh, first lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Would have been in Vietnam. That wouldn't have been a really good choice probably. 
probably would have gotten some guys killed because that wasn't really my forte. So I did stay volunteering with the radio station. And I did wind up doing things like buying the transmitter. And I got to meet um, Jim Lawrence, who was our contract chief engineer. And of course, we had a uh, the small meter LA-2 in our chain with the 250 and then later the kilowatt transmitter. And uh, so I'd go over to Eagle Rock and visit with him. And he built transmitters. And I learned a little bit about just how difficult it was to get type acceptance. So later when a friend at Paramount in the audio department said his first serious job was he went down to Louisiana and helped a chief engineer build his backup transmitter and run it completely through type acceptance. I was truly impressed. It was a really good idea that one of my junior college teachers, because when I went after working for a year and going, no, doing something I'm not interested in is really a bad idea. So I was lucky enough that I got to start meeting people. And then I joined the AES and I really started meeting people. I had met someone at Caltech. We had built a recording studio that was totally dead. Would have been a lovely 1970s, let's multitrack. But this was 1963 or four. That was not a good sound for uh, a string band. So mostly I went and recorded at the Ice House Troubadour in the Ash Grove, started working on their sound systems, and I met Wally Heider and Frank Demidio at uh, one of the uh, Ashgrove evenings he re now Ice House, when uh, they came over with the three-track half-inch, a hot-rodded 351. But Domitio was from Cuba and really good at making things work. Start with what you got. As I love Teddy Roosevelt says, take what you got, where you are, use it. And uh, I've, I've come to really respect that whole approach, whether I've seen it in uh, Zambia or Kenya or Mexico or, you know, uh, shade tree mechanics all over the country here. Wes, what were the microphones you were using in that first studio? Well, I was really lucky. I bought a 655C, a broadcast mic, used at the local uh, electronics place, Dow Radio, Happy Dow. It was a really nice mic, although I discovered that if you put on string bass, it had certain dynamic limits at low frequencies. There was, you know, it had went out past 20, out to 20 pretty smooth. It was small diaphragm, and you stuck it near a, uh, a bass, and it, it, it would uh, kind of run out of uh, room to move. So we went to a uh, Hal Roach auction when the studios were turned into housing down in Culver City and bought a U-47 without a power supply. So that was my ba ma major, and that's where I got all the stuff to make my four-bed, four-car garage just totally dead. But uh, that was the first studio we built out, a pair of A7500s, Marantz 8B, Power App, Round 7C. Um, it was a great room to listen to the stuff we recorded at the clubs. And uh, when I recorded people there, I'd had to run the loudspeakers. You know, we try to do what I was taught by Wally after I met him and Frank and help them load out. They were in their 50s, and I was in my early 20s, and they went, oh, what are you doing next Friday? Why? Well, we'd like to hire you. Okay. What do I do? Show up here. And I showed up at United Western. We loaded the truck. We took it over to the uh, Whiskey A Go Go. We uh, you know, hauled it around upstairs. We hooked up a bunch of cables. And uh, you know, we spent two days recording Johnny Rivers. And it sold well. And I went, oh, wow, look at what they do here. And I was hooked. But what really hooked me was when I was doing my radio show, 
friendly folk on Friday nights. I would talk to people who played at the clubs. And one night I opened my mouth and talked to um, Tommy Makem, who was with the Clancy Brothers. And at the time, I didn't quite appreciate how they really were the four most famous Irishmen in the world. But uh, what I did was I said, hey, I do a radio show. It'd be fun to do a live set. How about staying late tonight at the Troubadour and uh, recording a set for me? And when the words came out of my mouth and I listened to them, I went, uh, I've never done that. Why did I say that? But he said yes. So at midnight, I was taking the radio station apart, and I found a roll of tape, and I checked it and recorded on the 350, and I pulled the 350 out of the console and realized it was in three parts, but it looked like you could plug it back together. And I put it in my old car, and I uh, took the announce mic, and I couldn't find headphones, but I checked the tape recorded, So, and I checked that there that I could record with the microphone in the mic position, and I went and did my mo first remote. I put it up in front of them, and they had done exactly the same thing a few years before when they needed something to sell to raise money to pay rent so they could uh, continue to get their food and uh, a little bit of cash from playing at the Irish pubs, but they needed money for rent which allowed them to go to a lot of uh, auditions and be told, no, we don't need you for this play. But they got told once in a hundred, yeah, we need you. It was an amazing place. And they paid you money just to be on stage and talk. So in the middle of all that, the people at uh, Columbia came to him and said, hey, we'll give you 100,000 front money. And we'll do all the recording and distribution, and we'll pay you uh, commissions on how many we sell. And if you want to go do live stuff, uh, you'll probably get booked a lot. And uh, the cool thing about that is you get to keep all that money. That was a lot of money up front back then. It was huge money. And they did really, really well. And, of course, after that, when they became stars, I never talked to them again other than... Yeah, I caught him early on at the Troubadour, and uh, they were kind enough, and they knew what to do with the single mic. And when at 4 o'clock in the morning, I put all this back together at, so the station could go on the air at 6, and they wouldn't know what I'd done, and they couldn't tell me, don't do such a fool thing again. I played it back, and it sounded like some of the favorite moments in my life when I was 15 years old and had scooted myself in the middle of a string band some people at school had put together. And they'd sing together and play banjo and fiddle and mandolin and guitar. And I didn't do any of that, but I loved to uh, scoot myself in the middle and sing along. And it was the best sound I'd ever heard in my life. And I was listening to them on a single mic, and it sounded like, being in the middle of a string band again. And I went, I want to do more of that. And ever since then, I've been trying to recapture that moment of just being in the middle of the group and life is good. And sometimes it's taken uh, learning stuff I had no idea and even designing stuff that I didn't know I could design. But that, that's what I've been doing the rest of my life, is recapturing that moment as often as I can and helping other people do that as well. That's a great way to put it, Wes, really. Yeah, I think we all have that same sort of uh, background, you know. When, when, you have, when you put a mic in front of great people, it makes your job so much easier. Well, I once was with Wally when he was asked, well, how do you make a great recording? And he said, it's easy. You find great musicians. You find a room they like to play in. You record them from the moment they're there till the moment they're all gone. And you find out in the process how good you are with microphones. 
And his attitude was, if you don't like how it sounds, move the microphone. If you don't like it still, change the microphone. And I remember when he got, he was still working at United Western for Bill, and he was recording off as his weekend thing that he and Frank would do. And uh, no one wanted to haul all that stuff around. You know, when my first decent machine was an Ampex 354, and four channels of Altec compressor preamps that I had pulled the compressor tube out because I didn't want that. But they were nice preamps. They had, the Peerless were nice transformers. And uh, that was a lot of stuff to haul around. So I got from early on, from Hyder at one end, with George Augsburger earlier, with Dick Rosmini and uh, Richard Heiser. I met a lot of astonishing people, you being one of them. And uh, I listened to the stories, and as you can tell, I talk a lot. And sometimes I had the good sense to listen like I did that night at the Troubadour and went, wow, they know what to do with a single mic. That sounds so cool. That sounds like being there. How do you do that? And right now we're being there, but we're 3,000 miles apart, recording 2496 through Doug Fern preamps and, uh, and ADA and microphones. Mics. Yeah. That's right, yep. In my case, we, we might be listening to the two foot away, well, maybe a 25 degree angle, 44. CXE, and then from the inches away, KU5A, the one in the tradition of Wolfman Jack and President Dwight D. Eisenhower. A close-up mic for, uh, for talking about stuff here. Right. And I should mention I'm using an AEA R44CE, which is what I've used for all the podcasts so far. I'm working a little closer than I normally do. Um, it's about 18 to 20 inches. I'm normally about 24 inches and a little bit off axis. I'm normally standing, but today I'm, I'm sitting down because we're going to talk for a while. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's just the best thing I've found for this. And it's, it's really my favorite mic for so many things. Well, I've been back to your place in Pennsylvania, so I know that you have a quiet environment. I'm in the middle of a city with a four-lane road on the other side of about um, oh, nine inches of sheetrock and such and spaces uh, in between the sheetrock itself. So I, I looked at two feet away and I went, well, we'll try it. And then I put the KU-5 up close because I know that one works in some very adverse environments also does a great job of sports casting and uh, on stage vocal. It's just, you know, I'm really proud that people who use a lot of our mics running from Marty Stewart and the Fabulous Superlatives, because I'm a Roots guy, as you can tell from well, the first group I ever recorded for a re record was uh, the Dry City Scat Band. And they, they had uh, people in it that uh, Richard Green, the fiddler, went out for eight years when he turned 18 and broke his parents' heart. Uh, but he went and followed Bill Monroe and played fiddle for him. To uh, people who are uh, still playing today, Jackson Brown's favorite guitar player. If I could remember the name, I'd tell you. Okay. Well, you know, Wes, you're best known these days for your microphones. I mean, what was it about ribbon microphones that intrigued you, and, and how did you get started with that? Well, I was totally modern. You know, I started with that little Lecter voice, but I got a U47, and then we uh, made a trade with the guys at the Bitburg Audio Club. We built them a bunch of mixers they wanted custom. Bob Gerbrock was the other founder of AEA, and he was the physicist. And he had written an article that how I met him about building a custom mixer tube one 
in Audio Magazine. I saw he was local. And unlike another guy who did such an article uh, who went on to found Spectrosonics, but he was all the way out an hour away in San Bernardino at an Air Force base, this guy was just down a mile and a half at, a, at Caltech, so I went and introduced myself. But uh, he and I started doing things. We built the power supplies for the 47 we bought without one, and then we made a trade uh, because the people at the Air Force Base wanted little mixers, and we told them, yeah, we can build a little mixer. And he designed it, and I built them all, and we traded that for a couple of U-67s, brand new. No cables or anything else, but connectors. So we built everything for that. We'd already been building a mixer to go with the four channels of preamps, the Altex we had. So we came up in the area where if you couldn't build it, you didn't have it. And uh, we were busy trying to build stuff so that we could, I could go and record my radio show because that was just fun. At some point, I managed to meet, as I say, Wally Hyder and such. At that point, I got, I, I discovered there was an audio engineering society, which I'd been a member for about 55 years, where uh, people would a answer totally ignorant questions, and I had totally ignorant questions. I'm not really a good student. I don't disappear for days and read books and uh, remember quadratic equations, although at one point I had to memorize that one. But I just, I wanted to do stuff, and if you want to do stuff, I'd at least had the junior high school, seventh, eighth, ninth grade shop classes, drafting, mm -hmm. yeah. a metal shop, print shop, electrical, wood shop. So I vaguely knew enough to help build a studio and I knew enough to uh, drill holes, and I knew enough to sketch things out, and uh, the end result was I gradually started to learn some real skills, and I was lucky enough to miss the Vietnam War, but I didn't do that. I just, I had a chance to learn a lot of stuff, and I wound up with a degree from a Quaker school in early childhood studies, and I went and recorded music at schools, churches, clubs, any place I could. And that's how I made enough money to pay my way through school. And I was not 21 and 65. I was more like 29 and 72, or 22 it would have been in 65, that I finally graduated and got a degree in early childhood studies. I never knew that. Well, I... I had taken my electronics at Pasadena City College, and I'd taken the general ed. And I did both of them. And the electronics is what I used to keep things running so I could work, and I loved it. But I knew I was going to do that no matter what. And I kind of looked, and uh, there's a small Quaker-founded school here called Pacific Oaks, and they did a degree in early childhood development. And I said, you know, if by any chance... I marry and we have kids. It'd be really cool to have some idea of what eh, perhaps more normal families were. Because my family came out of the Depression. They came out of Oklahoma and Arkansas. And yeah, like many of the, the family, uh, you know, we're duallys. There are some of us who drink a lot. I happen not to be one of those. But, yeah, you know, we're a bit crazy. But as a friend of mine said, yeah, you're weird, Wes, but stay that way because you do some great stuff. Good advice. Dad's advice was, let's be W.L. Bill Dooley and son. And I would have made more money than I could have any other way. And I said, you know, I want to do something in the arts, preferably with music. And he said, good luck. You know, mm -hmm. but nothing happens till you sell something, kid. But I'm real persistent recording music and having that experience of being back 15 years old and in the middle of a group of musicians and life was really really good that that's yeah that's my drug of choice so uh, I'm real fortunate I'm 77 and I'm uh, still get to do this 
And if I isolate like this, 3,000 miles away from someone I'm talking to, I might have the good fortune to get to continue to do it for a while. And the microphones we've done, starting with the 44, which was, uh, it was 1995, since 76 when they dumped the division, and a friend said, go uh, meet my friend, the chief, or the ex-chief of in charge of building microphones, John Sank, in uh, New Jersey. And I did, after an AES convention. And he showed me how to ribbon a 44, gave me ribboning material, and gave me some of the tooling from the labs for making the ribbons. And said, uh, we got way more than we need because they were going to just throw it out. And this just jams my basement here, laboratory. So why don't you take that and see what you can do? Wow, what a gift. It was a great gift. And of course, my hand skills aren't that good. I don't do ribboning. So I had other people I worked with, though. And it's huge. You know, I started with the credit to my Uncle Jay Wesley. I mentioned Rob, Dr. Robert J. Gabrock, Bob Gabrock, a fine musician and a wonderful person who put up with me who really just ran around and didn't know much about what he wanted to do in life, but thought that I was doing some interesting things, and we, we started up this thing together, and then he got a chance to get real jobs and make real money. And as my son said, well, you had to marry a school teacher so you could work in the arts. And I said, yeah, I married really well, and if you ever marry, I hope you marry that well. And uh, I went a lot of years where I lived where I worked. My edit room for the recording I did was my bedroom, except it wasn't obvious that it was my bedroom because <laughs> that was just when I slept. The end result was that I've had way more fun and way more time to learn stuff. And you just do what you can with what you got where you are, which is the exact quote from Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, it's amazing. If you get enough time, you might have a chance to do something significant. And what we did was we took the microphones, which was the original question you asked. We took the microphones that RCA had done, and the 77 was nice. It was flexible. It let you do a lot of stuff, and no two sounded the same. And I'm now familiar from our service with the 77A, that huge mic, 77B and C, which were double ribbon mics, an Omni and a cardioid and a transformer uh, mixer set up. And then the uh, D, which came out of a total accident, they figured out, oh, this is what happened. The story was on the Omni, they were working on trying to make the Omni a better Omni because the native natural pattern for a ribbon is figure eight. And that was the genius of what uh, was done by Dr. Olson when they bought the patent from Siemens for the uh, ribbon mic, the one that the nuclear, nuclear I can almost say that word, physicist, uh, Dr. William Schottke had done back in 23. He and uh, Gerlach did a patent for a a loudspeaker done with a ribbon, and then uh, he filed later for another patent just by himself because he went, oh, if it works this way, this is a reciprocal electrodynamic thing. I'll, I'll put a patent in for, a, uh, for making a ribbon microphone. And, of course, what they wanted was a directional one, so there was this huge thing that they made for Telefunken because everybody was trying to make movie sound. That was the big thing that was going to make a ton of money, and it did. Sound with picture. So I have in one of, one of those, and that one had so much plumbing out the back, and it doesn't sound bad. But what was brilliant was Olson took, and with the 44 or the PB90, the one they leased out, they did a really cool thing. They just put the ribbon out in free air, and it was the native and natural figure eight pattern. It's off axis response on the um, horizontal plane was almost exactly. So the, the pickup 
of all the spill or bleed, or in this case, the entire room, because you'd use one mic and that was it for everything, was great. It sounded like being there. And it had response out to 30 kilohertz in the B version in 36. And as Les Paul said, that was the first great music mic. That one and the slightly easier to build, but almost identical mic, the BX, uh, they made for 20 years. And Les said that was his pick for the best first great music mic. And he owned five of them, and I own one of them. Wow. Well, it's, you know, it's amazing to me, and, and I have copies of Harry Olson's notes from developing the 44 and a bunch of other things he worked on, because he worked on a lot of stuff at RCA. Yeah. And it, it's still amazing to me that what was probably the first really good fidelity microphone that existed in the world, you know, that was readily available, is still... One of the best sounding microphones ever made. Well, talking to Les, he just said everything else got better. Preamps, loudspeakers, power amps to drive him, and the recorders. But in all that process, all that happened with the 44 BBX was it just sounded more like the music. Yeah. And I, my summary of it is like a Stradivarius. It just got it right. Right. And, you know, the thing about Harry Olson and looking at his notes, he, you know, obviously was a scientist, a physicist. He really understood or learned, pioneered the the physics behind how all this worked. But he also knew what it was supposed to sound like. And he tested all those mics with music and with yeah. voices to guide him in the design. That was the thing that, that was the key thing I learned, which was it, I've been really fortunate. I got to work with uh, Wootke at Sheps. He's taught me a bit about measurement, turned me on to Clio Automatica down in uh, Italy, in Florence. But the key thing I learned from talking with John Sank was you listen to it. When it sounds good, it is good. I've been talking with Wes Dooley, founder of Audio Engineering Associates and a lifelong student of the technology of music recording. There's more to this conversation, and I will have Wes back again on a future show so we can go into more detail on the design and manufacturing of microphones. This is my take on music recording. I'm Doug Fern. See you next time.